Hi, everyone. So this is work with my colleagues at Google Brain, so a bunch of people. This talk is about self-supervision, so we're going to define what it is and why it matters. Um, so supervised learning on top uh, typically requires humans to sit down and manually assign discrete labels to, um, to images and uh, that describe the semantics of an image, for example. So, uh, here you have a point task, and for each image, maybe you want to ask humans to say exactly how the hand is positioned and if there's liquid flowing or not. Um, but this is, uh, even though this, this is very uh, effective uh, for some tasks, it's very costly and often impractical. And, and especially for robotics, it doesn't, doesn't uh, work out for us. Uh, so then you have unsupervised learning, uh, which uh, often is going to be about trying to reconstruct the, the input um, after applying some sparsity priors on the outputs. And then you have self-supervised learning, which is a subset of unsupervised learning, but it's more about um, finding automatic ways to find labels to, so that you can uh, extract signals such as, uh, using signals such as depth or time. So these two unsupervised learning algorithms, what they have in common is that usually produce more complete representations and also continuous. Uh, that are not going to be uh, biased or limited by humans. So why is self-supervision important for robotics? Um, so first, like I said, supervised learning uh, works well, but it doesn't scale to the real world. Uh, and that's because the real world is very high dimensional. It's continuous and also ambiguous. So for example, in this task, the point task, if you ask a robot to do, do that, uh, it needs to know um, when, uh, a bunch of things. It needs to know when the hand is touching the container, uh, what, what position it is in, is, is, if there's liquid flowing or not, how much liquid is in the recipient. Um, and that is uh, necessary for learning the task, but also to do it yourself. Um, and so these attributes are difficult to label, and you, you can't do it for every new situation. So another reason to self-supervise when it comes to objects is that um, objects don't always uh, fit in, into one single class, and they might be ambiguous, and there might be some uh, subtle dimensions that you care about. For example, the openness dimension that maybe humans are not going to label that for you. So maybe that's something you want to self-discover. Uh, um, also, we'd like to do online adaptation uh, without labels so that all robots, robots can be robust to new situations and new objects. Um, so bottom line is that it's, it's not really... Uh, practical to ask humans to label every aspect of every new scene uh, and precisely label continuous dimensions either. So instead we want our models to discover and disentangle the abstract dimensions that matter without explicit supervision. So you can think of a self-supervised robot as one that is going to teach itself about the world by interacting with it without direct supervision. Uh, and I want to echo what Francois said earlier is that uh, not only there are many signals in the world that you can use to self-teach, but also um, uh, having embodiment is maybe the only way to, to learn some things. So to reach AGI, maybe you know, using robots might be the only way. Um, so some of the signals that you can uh, harvest here um, when you have an embodied agent are time, viewpoints, depth, tactile and audio feedback, uh, intrinsic motivation, uh, curiosity, and imitation. Uh, and all of these, these uh, signals can be captured using onboard perception only. So in this talk, we're going to focus on two, uh, acquiring, acquiring two very important skills for robotics. One is imitation, one is learning about objects. And note that we're going to self-supervise to acquire these skills. But uh, once we have these skills, we can also use that to self-supervise even more and unlock higher order signals uh, for self-supervision. So for example, imitation, is a very strong signal for acquiring complex skills without supervision. So the term contrastive learning has been used in multiple contexts. What we mean here is the type of learning where you only need to know if two samples should be close to each other or, or not. So you, you see these two points, uh, blue points. Uh, so each point represents a point in embedding space, and each image can be transformed uh, using a deep net into a low dimensional vector, say eight dimensional embedding. And so in this case, you, we might want the uh, green cup images to be close to each other in embedding space. And we might want the, the blue plate to be far apart from the rest. So uh, in this case, we show how 
Uh, this is uh, triple loss, which is how it works. So before training, you could have a, um, a case where the two blue points that are supposed to be close, close to each other are actually far apart. And after training, um, the blue point is closer and the, the red one is further away uh, beyond a certain margin. Uh, so this type of learning is also called met metric learning or simulated learning. And we, there are other losses they can use, uh, including Siamese loss and, and, and Peirce loss. So the first step of contrastive learning we're introducing is called Time Contrastive Networks. And this was published at uh, ICRA uh, this year. Um, so here we're going to use time and multiple views to teach ourselves to differentiate between all the states in the scene. So, so you have two views of the same action being uh, performed. And um, we want to be able to say, to recognize what's going on in there without being, being told anything. Um, so, so using the contrastive loss, uh, we're going to pull together uh, the two blue frames that are, come from the same time, so we know that functionally they represent the same thing, um, but they come from different viewpoints. And at the same time, we're going to push apart this uh, red frame, which is uh, a bit later in time, and here the effect is that our model has to capture how the two blue frames, oh, and this goes through a deep network and you get an embedding. So it has to capture how the two blue frames have a similar uh, semantics even though they look different. And then across the X axis, it has to figure out how the blue and the red frame um, are different even though they look more similar. So, so you have these like, two constraints happening at the same time. And the only way the model can really satisfy these two constraints is by understanding the pose of the hand, for example, or how much liquid is in the, uh, in the cup. Um, so this dual constraint is a very strong signal that you can use to learn uh, representations that are rich enough to actually use it for a robot to imitate people. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, so we also have a single view version uh, of the same thing where you, the, the frames that are close to each other in time are pull, pulled together and the, the one that are further away in time are pushed apart. Um, and this, this is how we capture uh, multi-view data. It's pretty easy. You, can, you just need two uh, smartphones. Um, so here we perform a nearest neighbor imitation of, uh, between two videos of the same task. Um, so the video on the right has to kind of align itself to the video on the left, basically. Uh, so if, if the videos are doing the same thing, uh, it means the model has understood all the, all the states uh, of the video. If it was jumpy, then you, you would tell that it doesn't exactly understand everything. Um, so here it still produces a sensible imitation even when uh, there's no liquid being poured. So in this case, the bottle is, uh, is close, but it still understands how it should imitate to the left. Okay, so now how do we use this for robotic, robotic imitation? So first we learn the embedding from a collection of raw, raw unable videos like we did before. Um, and, and these videos don't have to be just positive demonstrations. We, we can just learn from pixels. We don't really care if they're positive or negative demonstrations. Uh, and second, we're going to learn a reinforcement learning uh, on top of that embedding space. So given a single demonstration uh, video from a human on the left, um, this, this is going to through the TCN representation and produce a single trajectory in space. And now the robot uh, feeds its own uh, visual feedback into, into that TCN and it gets a, a new trajectory. So the goal is it's going to try to imitate the same trajectory in the embedding space. And after only nine iterations, so this is iteration zero, after only nine iterations, it managed to, to figure out how to pour. Um, and this, you know, this only works because we use uh, pre-training. If you try to do that right, right from the RL signal, it would just not work. Okay, so another task we do is uh, pose imitation. So uh, here our model is able to self-teach how to imitate people, so from the right to the left. And so again, there's no labels whatsoever used here. And so somehow it uh, almost magically discovered how to its own body corresponds to the human body. Um, and the, the reason it works is, is because TCN is um, able to abstract beyond appearance and match uh, things that are semantically similar. Um, so, so here, when, when the robot goes up and down, there's, there's only one joint that's involved. But 
when the Schumann goes up and down, there's many joints involved. So, so if you uh, try to supervise that, it would, it's not even clear how you would do that. So we argue that it's easier and better to just let the model discover the, the mapping between the two bodies. So we have shown how we can contrast frames within the sequence, and now uh, we're going to try to see if we can also contrast subsequences. So it's the same idea as before. You have uh, you know, sequences, windows of frames in blue, and you push against the red one. Um, and so we tested this approach on two simulated environments, so Cardpool and Cheetah. And in, in both cases, we just took a slightly different uh, viewpoint in 3D, and that's, that's how we get this uh, uh, multi-view signal uh, for TCN. Um, and this is enough to, to train, uh, to teach yourself to represent everything that's going on here. Uh, so again, we, uh, so we train uh, reinforced learning on top of these representations. And so here you have the upper bound performance, which is a true state representation. Um, it's the ground truth, if you will. Uh, we show that our embeddings uh, learned just from vision can do that task almost as well if you, if you use the ground truth embedding. So for both tasks. And this is the resulting policy for Calpol. So on the left, you have the ground truth uh, representations. On the right is just the representation learned just from pixels. And same for the chi data, which is just learning to run. Um, so it works as well, uh, even though it was just learned from pixels. Uh, so we showed that we can uh, discover motion attributes on the pouring data set, and uh, such as like is, is the hand going towards the cup or receding away from it or is going up and down. Um, and we also showed that using motion actually helped us also do a better job at, at uh, classif classifying the static attributes. All right, so another contrastive model that we introduced is uh, called object contrastive networks. And um, here, instead of contrasting across time, we're going to contrast across objects. So, but we're doing to, going to do so without any, using any labels again. So here, the idea is that we're going to use multiple scenes. Uh, so let me just for you, show you. Oh, yeah, so, so we have a robot that uh, collects its own data. It goes around a table that has multiple objects. It goes around the table, it wants to see different viewpoints. Of the of the objects, um, and once that's done, then we we run a off the shelf uh, object nest detector, so we get bounding boxes, um, and then the, the job of the OCN is going to be to try to figure out between all these views uh, which objects match to each other. So the green cup isn't there; it should it should be. We want it to f to find the the true correspondence. So similar to before, here we have these uh, blue pairs that we pull together and, and red we push against. Um, except that this time we're not given the, the true uh, matches like, like it was given to us by time before. Um, here, instead, we're just going to use the nearest neighbor in numbing space to decide uh, who's matching who. And, um, and you might ask, uh, why should that even work? Because uh, things should be random initially. Um, th there are actually multiple reasons why this, this should work, and one of them is that uh, deep networks are actually uh, not completely random. They have some smoothness uh, baked into, into them. Uh, so two images uh, that are similar, they're not going to produce entirely random embeddings. So we're going to uh, exploit that property, and um, Eventually, the model is going to converge using uh, these kind of properties. So you can have some noise. So the, the noisy repulsion, repulsion between the, um, the yellow uh, mugs is, is kind of a mistake. But uh, it's not so bad, because if it matches the, the green cup, it's also you know, some reasonable match. So it doesn't have to be perfect, basically, to converge. OK, so this is the real data set that we used. And we also have a synthetic. Uh, data set for uh, quantitative experimentation. Um, so here, here is an example of how our model taught itself to rank objects from most similar to least similar, from left to right, for each row. So you can see that um, it discovers similarities based on class, based on color, or based on shape. So for example, the the bottom row, uh, you know, you have plates uh, on the bottom right, but it's, you know, it makes sense because it's also a round object here. So it discovers things in a very uh, organic way, which is good. That's, that's exactly what we want. Uh, same here for the synthetic data set here. And we have the, um, uh, the error rates for attributes classification. So we have uh, class, color, we have a bunch of binary attributes, 
Like, is it a container? Does it have uh, buttons that have wheels, these kind of things? And we use the fully supervised models as uh, lower, lower bound, and uh, because when you have labels, it's, you know, it's usually the, the lower bound uh, in error, and uh, the pre ImageNet pre-training as uh, upper bound, and we show, we, so we do much better than the upper bound error, and we, we're not far behind the lower bound error, even though we don't use any labels, which is kind of surprising. Uh, so we evaluate the quality of our embeddings in a pointing task. So here the robot is shown an object in front of it, and then it has to point to the object it thinks is the most similar to the, the object in front. Um, so it's able to do that task with pretty good accuracy, even though it was never given any labels for these objects or it hasn't even seen these particular objects uh, before. Uh, so we do observe some mistakes. Um, such as confusing a mug, mug and a bowl. But yeah, so these mistakes are this one, yeah. These mistakes are often somewhat sensible, like, you know, they're not uh, catastrophic uh, mistakes. And that's because it has a, a continuous understanding of things. Um, so another task is a grasping task where you, uh, the robot is being shown a, uh, an object that is not on a table, and then it has to pick up the object that it thinks is most similar. So on the left, we have objects that are this, the same uh, shape, but different colors. So it, it picks the one with the same color. On the right, we have objects of the same color, but different shapes, and then it picks the right shape. Okay, so finally, we evaluate how well our embeddings uh, can uniquely identify and track objects it hasn't seen before. So if we compute, so the frame on the left is the first frame of that video. And for each object, we're going to compute the embedding um, and then for the subsequent frames, uh, we match them to, to the, the embedding of the first frame. So on the right is the ground truth labeling that we, we did ourselves, uh, just to compute the tracking accuracy. And so here we're not gonna use any uh, tricks like uh, optical flow. Um, this is just frame-based matching, um, which you know, has the advantage of um, having this really absolute understanding of things as opposed to just using time as a trick. So if the robot sees an object in the house um, one day and then the next day sees it in a different room, it will still recognize that it's the same object. And that's pretty useful for robotics. Um, so here are the results on, on the... So every time there's a mistake, there's a matching mistake that is made, there's a red bounding box that's gonna flash. So on the top left is our OCN result, which gets 8% error, while the supervised pre-training baseline on the bottom left get, gets 13% error. Um, and when we train entirely from scratch on the top right, uh, we get almost as good results as the uh, supervised, uh, pre-trained supervised. So here it's very clear why self-supervision is good, because the robot can adapt to this new situation and do much better than something that's been uh, pre-trained offline. Um, and so, and also the fact that here we have continuous embeddings, you know, if, if you have, say, uh, you ask a robot to bring you the green plate, brings you something you're not okay with, and then you can say, oh no, I want the one that's more green, or I want the one that's more round, uh, it will understand what that means. Okay, so to recap, the takeaways are that contrastive learning is a good way to learn without any labels and we were able to contrast images, sequences, and objects. And that enabled various applications that can, that can really uh, robustly adapt to new environments. And that's it, thank you.